Hi, in this tutorial we're going to discuss beta oxidation. In the previous cellular respiration tutorial, we looked at the TCA cycle. Now we're going to have a look at how fatty acids can be used to create the acetyl-CoA needed in the TCA cycle. First of all, let's see what a fatty acid looks like. In its simplest form, Fatty acids have a carboxylic acid group with a long chain of carbons hanging down off it. This R represents any amount of extra carbons that could be hanging off the carboxylic acid. So these fatty acids come from the fats in our diet and they are a great source of energy. You'll see why in a moment. But first of all, they need activating and transporting into the mitochondria. The first step is to add adenosine to the fatty acid, and this creates an acyl adenylate. The adenosine comes from adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and we get rid of a pyrophosphate in the process. Using the high energy ATP in this process charges up the molecule for its next transformation. With the help from an enzyme, this molecule now becomes an acyl-CoA. Coenzyme A is required for this reaction, and it replaces the adenylate, which now gets kicked out. The enzyme that orchestrates all this is acyl-CoA synthetase. It's important not to confuse acyl-CoA with acetyl-CoA. An acyl-CoA is pretty much just any fatty acid with a coenzyme A molecule attached. However, acetyl-CoA is the substrate for the TCA cycle. The whole purpose of beta oxidation is to turn this acyl-CoA into many acetyl-CoAs. Now if the acyl-CoA has 12 carbons or less, then it can just diffuse through the inner mitochondrial membrane and undergo beta oxidation. However, most fatty acids in our diet have more than 14 carbons, so they get taken through the inner mitochondrial membrane using the carnitine shuttle. I'll show you how that works now. The acyl-CoA gets a carnitine attached and the coenzyme A pulled off. Therefore, it becomes an acyl carnitine. The coenzyme A gets recycled, and obviously, a carnitine molecule is needed for this process. The enzyme that does this is carnitine acyltransferase 1, and it's located in the outer mitochondrial membrane. Now, here we have the inner mitochondrial membrane, and stuck in it is this transferase protein which allows the acylcarnitine to pass through. This now means the acylcarnitine is within the inner mitochondrial membrane. A coenzyme A molecule now gets reattached and the carnitine pulled off, and this recreates our acyl-CoA. The only difference is that this time the acyl-CoA is within the inner mitochondrial membrane. The enzyme that does all this is carnitine acyltransferase 2. The carnitine then gets shuttled back across the membrane to continue this process. Now that the acyl-CoA is located within the mitochondria, beta oxidation proper can occur. This process has four phases. In the first, the acyl-CoA is dehydrogenated to form a trans-delta-2-enoyl-CoA. In this process, FAD plus is reduced and becomes the high-energy molecule FADH2. This FADH2 molecule can be used in the electron transport chain, which we'll discuss in the next tutorial in this series. The enzyme that oversees this reaction is the intuitively named acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. This process is an oxidation reaction. This is because FAD is an oxidizing agent. 
Therefore, it oxidizes the acyl-CoA molecule. And the end result is that a new double bond is formed between the second and third carbon in the molecule. This is known in fatty acid nomenclature as a double bond between the alpha and beta carbons. Moving along, this molecule with its new double bond gets water added across that double bond, forming an L-beta hydroxyacyl-CoA. The enzyme involved here is called enoyl-CoA hydratase. Because water is added, we call this process hydration. The end result is that we get a brand new hydroxyl group on our beta carbon. The third step in beta oxidation is the dehydrogenation of this new hydroxyl group. To do this, the oxidizing agent NAD plus is reduced to the high energy NADH, which will also be used in the electron transport chain. The enzyme here is beta hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase, and the overall process is another oxidation reaction. So note that we now have a new carbonyl group on our beta carbon. The next step is thiolysis, which cuts off the molecule through here. If you're paying close attention, you may notice that everything to the left of this dashed line looks like an acetyl-CoA molecule. And cutting it loose, indeed, gives us a brand new acetyl-CoA molecule. Now all we have to do is whack a new coenzyme A molecule on the end of the stuff to the right of the dash line, and we have an acyl-CoA ready to go around the cycle again, but this time with two fewer carbons. The enzyme that does all this is called thiolase, and this process is therefore called thiolysis. And I'll just put a reminder here that every time the molecule goes around the cycle, it has two fewer carbons. The molecule will keep going around the cycle until there are no more carbons left. To recap, the acyl-CoA has two carbons removed from it in the form of acetyl-CoA every time it goes around this cycle. This happens until there are no carbons left. Now that's great, unless there are an odd amount of carbons in the fatty acid or it has double bonds where you don't want them to be. To deal with this, an isomerase and a reductase get rid of unwanted double bonds, and odd number of fatty acids are sent through this cycle until they are three carbons long, then they get sent through a series of three reactions which turn them into succinyl-CoA, at which point they can also enter the TCA cycle. Finally, the acetyl-CoAs which we have created can then head off to the TCA cycle, which is also known as the Krebs cycle, for even more energy production. So you can see that a 16-carbon fatty acid, like palmitic acid, can create quite a lot of energy, as it creates 8 acetyl-CoAs for the TCA cycle. Compare that with the 2 that a glucose molecule creates. This is part of the reason that fats are so energy dense. In the next tutorial, we'll be having a look at the electron transport chain, also known as oxidative phosphorylation. If you've enjoyed this tutorial, please help us produce more by making a donation at www.handwrittentutorials.com.